So assessment means lots of different things to lots of different people. In our school, we're really, really clear that enormous amounts of teacher marking is not assessment, it's feedback. But where we want to assess, we want to really know what young people have understood and what they can do. Hi everyone and welcome to the EdTech podcast. Uh, For any new listeners this week, our mission is to improve the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. And my name is Sophie Bailey. For everyone else, welcome and thank you to listener Matthew Sansom, Professor and Head of Department of Performance and Media at Sunway University, who messaged me on LinkedIn to say, Hi Sophie, really enjoying and benefiting from your EdTech podcast Thanks a lot. So uh, thank you very much for the kind message, Matthew. And I'm really pleased that you're tuning in. And if you're also loving the podcast, then don't forget that you can also go to wherever you're listening in to rate and review so others can find out about us. Um, This week's bonus episode is a live recording featuring a discussion I hosted at the Frog 20 conference back in August with two school leaders talking about how they kept calm and carried on during 2020 to date. So stay listening in if you're facing the rest of 2020 and feeling like you need a boost somewhat or some extra ideas on how to manage the madness. And if you enjoy this recording, there's another Frog 20 leadership event on Tuesday the 10th of November, this time on blended learning and how to better engage with parents. You can find the free sign up at frogeducation.com forward slash frog 20. I really enjoyed the uh, chat feed at the last virtual event, which had educators from all over the world, including various parts of the UK, Malaysia and Amman that I remember um, and people swapping notes on how things have been for them during Covid which I found really insightful and also generous to see how much sharing was going on. Um, So I'm going to moderate another discussion at the next virtual event in November and hope to see you there. Right here we go stay safe folks and thank you for everything that you're doing for learning right now in the most difficult of circumstances. Bye-bye. And before we start the panel just a few points the first one was just I really wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to all of the educators on this call and, and the leaders in schools because it's easy to forget as we're going into this next phase this was a huge effort and a selfless effort towards our children's learning so I really wanted to say thank you. A big welcome to our guests so I'll just quickly go over some introductions for those people who may have joined after today's keynote. So Nick House who's with us here is head teacher at Greenshaw High School. He was described apparently by Ofsted as having impressive clarity and drive which I very much uh, crave uh, having had a lockdown baby so enjoy that Nick. Kate Ragg is deputy head teacher at the Education and Leadership Trust and teacher of computing and also the Cross Trust lead on e-learning and e-safety. So a powerhouse from Manchester with us. And hopefully later we'll also have Neelam Palmer, who is the director of e-learning at Ashwood School. Neelam's written some great blogs for us on implementation of EdTech. So much to Kate's point about doing a few things well rather than trying to do everything and, and nothing sort of working. My first question is to Kate. Kate, Wally Range, I hope I pronounced all these schools correctly, is a large 11 to 18 high school of 1,500 girls located in the heart of inner city Manchester. One of the schools is 1,000 girls. The East Manchester Academy is a mixed school of 970 students in the heart of Manchester's regeneration area. And the Education Leadership Trust serve some of the most deprived wards in Manchester and some of the most culturally diverse, with over 90% of sixth form students from ethnic minority backgrounds. So my question here was, first of all, that's a lot of students and a lot of individual needs. And it will be no surprise to many people listening in that school budgets are strapped. So I just wondered how you went about, you know, considering the investments, if there are any investments that needed to be made when you were sort of tackling this challenge or whether you used existing tech. And that isn't necessarily investments in the monetary sense, but more where did you focus your attention, whether it's on teacher training or implementing new technology to tackle that complex problem 
Hello. Thank you, Sophie. In terms of the tech, yes, there are shrinking budgets. I have to say the executive head and the head teachers at the Education Leadership Trust have been amazing and tried to protect a lot of the tech budget as far as we can over the last few years. So actually, the tech was all in place. One of the things that we found was that not all the staff knew how to use it properly. And that was the biggest thing for us. So we actually had the platforms, we had all of the connectivity that we needed. The biggie for us was that although a lot of the students have mobile phones, and in fact, in two of our schools, the students are on the Wi-Fi and are encouraged to bring their phones into school as long as they connect to the Wi-Fi, which is filtered. Obviously, we ran into problems when it came to students accessing devices and we, we, we've we lent out just about every single mobile device we've got. We've virtually stripped the schools in terms of lending those out. I'm in the process of trying to get them all back at the moment, which is my August challenge. We had devices that came through from the DfE, 136 devices across three and a half thousand children. So yeah. that didn't go very far. We've worked with local charities, we've worked with the the local authority, we're just trying everything that we can really to to try and get as many devices out there as possible. That's one of the reasons why we want to do another tech survey in September, because even though we'd lent devices to households, we discovered perhaps that one household might have five children using one computer. So when we set up the timetable, one of the big challenges for us was not to have a timed timetable because the students could be accessing it depending on when their time slot with the device was. And so we did um, a very similar timetable to the one that Nick showed earlier. And ours were called sessions and they they were hyperlinked through, but there was no prescriptive time. The only time that was prescriptive was when there were some live lessons via audio, some via video, but they they were at drop-in points in the week. They weren't specifically, it's Tuesday, it's 10 o'clock. If you do business studies, you've got to be here. We ran as many drop-in points as we can to offer access, but it is a big challenge. That's a really interesting point about not having that luxury necessarily to have the whole whole day laid out. And I loved your point about making it bite-sized. So one one thing that I experienced um, when I was doing the, the whole homeschooling thing was the information that we were receiving was in kind of week block, you know, everything that you were going to do across the whole week. And I had this conversation with someone that the the way it was written was more because teachers are used to communicating to perhaps a supply teacher. And so it was kind of written out. And as a parent, that could be sometimes quite overwhelming to try and unpick. Were you offered something half term six, week three? You know, one of those, every time I saw that bit on the screen, it just made my heart sink because I thought the children don't know it's half term six, week three. They might know it's the, the 8th of July, but they don't know about weeks and timings. And that consistency of things is really important. Interestingly, you said about the about the shorter bursts as well. I mean, we we went through a very steep learning curve in terms of learning how to record store video footage if we were videoing lessons or videoing narrated powerpoints and the buffering and people saying well I've put my lesson together is it yeah but it's 20 minutes long and actually the children are are quite used to a a 15 second TikTok culture they're not going to sit there for 20 minutes while you're buffering we did learn an awful lot about keeping things short and keeping things in small blocks for management really all round, not just for the teachers, but for the children and the parents. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Kate. I'll I'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, I had a question for Neelam, but um, we'll we'll come back to that one. So Nick, my question to you is, your school, if I understand correctly, is a large mixed comprehensive in a highly selective outer London borough. As I'm sure you will have noticed, assessment is a hot topic right now. So I was keen to find out how your school managed to continue assessing students remotely And whether there's any learnings that we could take from this approach on a a sort of more macro level with everything that's going on in the exams crisis right now. One of our things that I'm really proud of is we're also a research school. So we were identified by the EEF as having some skills and knowledge and being a useful school to work with other schools across South London and the South East. And that means when you talk to me about things like assessment, I'm going to get really fussy and really detailed and pedantic about it. 
So assessment means lots of different things to lots of different people. In our school, we're really, really clear that enormous amounts of teacher marking is not assessment, is feedback. But where we want to assess, we want to really know what young people have understood and what they can do. And I think if I'm absolutely honest, over the summer term, our greatest focus was not on assessment. I think we were quite clear that the nature of learning in a remote situation was going to be profoundly different. I did say in my presentation that where pupils returned work, we sampled their work. So if we had a class of 30 pupils, we asked our teachers to maintain a mark book and make sure that they had sampled work from five to six students in a class of 30. And they were different five to six pupils each time. And then we would give general formative feedback to those pupils. So these seem to be some of the misconceptions. This is the kind of thing that we think we might need to return to as a group. In terms of pure assessment, I think there are so many complicating factors. We're assessing for learning and to know where the kids are at. We're not assessing as a summative activity because you don't know how long they spent on a task, what other external resources they might have used online typically. So I think the notion of assessment is actually really complex. I think if I'm also serious, the biggest area we sought to assess was kids' well-being incredibly difficult online so use proxies like engagement rates so how frequently are people logging on how frequently are they turning and work and i genuinely and i'm happy to say as a national state paid dfe head teacher that the biggest thing i was assessing for our young people was engagement rates connectedness and just being in the game and i think that's the most important thing we assessed Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear you say that because one of my big concerns was less the academic side for my son. It was more the socialisation and him sort of being stuck here on his own was a bit concerning. And I loved your point on familiarity. We had a past guest on the podcast before called Ted Fujimoto, and he talks about school reform and he talks about relationships, relevance and rigour. So this idea that actually the underpinnings of some of these things are actually quite boring. It's just, you know, making is the consistency, which isn't very glamorous, but but is what kind of gets things done as well. But on the note of familiarity, before I move on, when our son came back, I was one of those parents that thought, OK, keep your school uniform on because, you know, then uh, you'll feel like you're doing your schoolwork and everything. And strangely, when he went back to school, they didn't have to wear school uniforms. So that's the kind of uh, topsy-turvy world we, we live in at the moment. My sense of familiarity and routine has changed massively. I think when I was naive and a young teacher and didn't quite know what I know now, I thought that teenagers should be quite adaptable and flexible because the work, as I saw it, was messy and complex and unpredictable. So therefore, why shouldn't teenagers be able to get one sort of lesson in history and a different sort of lesson in French? And now, as I'm also a parent of a teenager myself and a little older, I know that teenagers, particularly talking to secondary colleagues in this meeting, they've got a heck of a lot of change going on in their lives already around their own identity, around their emerging sense of self. So to actually to have some familiarity and routine is really reassuring. Yeah, it is quite dull. And yes, it's not some super breakthrough research PhD, but I think it's incredibly secure and helps young people feel stable and feel familiar. And I think teenagers need that as much as anything we can of them, whether that's in the school or online. Absolutely. We we did an episode before on self-directed learning and the, the question there was, you know, if teenagers don't have their prefrontal cortex completely developed, are they actually capable of doing all the things that we would expect out of self-directed learning? And some, so perhaps sometimes that's a bit of a big ask. So another question for Kate. Your responsibilities at ELT also cover e-learning and e-safety. And we've heard on the podcast about terrible sort of safeguarding incidents during covid as well as the sort of much documented attainment gaps expanding due to the digital divide. And you may have covered some of this in your, in your last answer, but what's been your school's approach to these problems and how can tech be used to ha- perhaps sort of tackle some of them as well, if it, if it can indeed? Yeah, and that was one of the things that really worried me, actually. Safeguarding has to trump everything, really, in terms in schools. One of the things that worried me about the DFE offer, as wonderful as it was, there were lots of other offers from companies about lending kit. I actually asked somebody at the DFE in a phone call to them and said, can you just tell me, though, you're offering these webcam-enabled devices with internet dongles to the families who've got the least experience 
in terms of using these sorts of things safely? Well, you know, just generally from a work point of view, as well as the safety point of view, what safeguarding points are you actually going to put in there? And I think that in the end, they did actually put in some web filtering. But I have to say, we have got some absolutely gifted technicians here. And my infrastructure manager is amazing and managed to work out a way so that every device that we lent still went through all of our filters and actually have some software on computers, laptops as well that that do tracking. And that's true whether you're a brand new year seven or the executive head teacher, the same safeguarding software is on every single device in the school. Nobody's left out of that, that particular bubble, as it were. A really hard message to get across. I mean, two things that strike me about teenagers, interesting what Nick was saying about about teenagers. The other thing is a lot of people say, oh, teenagers use their mobile phones. They know what they're doing. But actually, a lot of teenagers don't know what they're doing with their mobile phones. They're really good at doing one or two small jobs, but they're not tech geeks. They're not forward thinking in terms of the damage that they might do. They're not they're not experienced enough, I suppose, to understand how important this impact is going to be on their life. I've spent just as much time during lockdown emailing Instagram, emailing some of the big companies, asking them to take down posts, asking them to take down fake accounts. And we just keep trying. We keep putting the message out there and we keep supporting the students and the staff when problems occur. But I would like to see some of the conversation change so that government are actually talking to some of these big social media companies at the moment if you're dealing with an issue with a young person on a social media platform it's almost impossible to make headway with them they're faceless sort of black holes that take Mm -hmm. emails and they just don't respond no matter what you say and I, I would like to see government tackling some of the big social media companies alongside some of the digital divide other than that we just keep going with the lessons we keep going and more than anything else we talk and we report we were doing weekly contact phone contact with all of our students as well to make sure that they were okay yeah I love I love the idea it's such a simple idea and I, and I know when you scale that up it's a lot of work but calling people individually whether you know on their birthdays or other moments to check in is is massive and I know I have friends that that have, have been doing that and the work involved so I know Neelam um, hasn't been able to make it but one point she made on a previous podcast was that in this age of remote learning where lessons aren't engaging there's nowhere to hide because of the data that you've mentioned that you can collect in terms of perhaps people logging in and that kind of thing so through looking at some of the back ends of these platforms have you been able to you know, redesign some of your lessons or sort of iterate what you're doing? And have you got any lessons to share with people that are watching or listening in about, you talked about earlier, making things smaller? If there's anything else like that that you'd like to share, that would be great as well. All of us were stepping into a slightly unknown world. And I think there are companies whose raison d'etre is online learning. So if you think about somebody like a maths provider, like Hegarty Maths, for example, they've learned this stuff, they've done this stuff, and they've gone through this a number of iterations. Schools do not have individual expertise to be able either to create the, the platform and the infrastructure or the pedagogy and the really known things that hook kids in. There are things about the way that Hegarty is designed that are really smart. There are things about the way Tassamai, the science quizzing platform, is designed that are really smart. So we had to stumble and we had to make sense about what we were doing. One of the really, really good things was we went back to things like principles around teaching and learning. So the notion of what we call dual coding, that language, whether that's heard speech, should be backed up by visual representation. So an image on the screen should help reinforce the understanding that the young person gets of what's being said. And we looked at some of our earlier slides and mostly staff were talking with slides in the background And they were just really confusing. They were cluttered. They were overloaded. They were badly designed. And so we managed to do some insects. We did some staff training in virtual meetings in May and June and gave some examples of some really brilliantly designed slides and said, this will help learning. Fundamentally, this will help really difficult concepts stick. 
And if we think it's difficult to teach difficult content when you've got an adult in the room that you can ask questions of, then amplify that by how difficult it is to learn in a remote setting. So that's one example of something that we learned about, not a lesson design so much, more of our resource design and being able to take pictures and images of our most gifted teachers' resources and then share them with other people and say, we can all do this stuff if you really carefully think about it. And we've now got resources that will be good for time. So if we didn't have a lockdown for the rest of this school year, some of those resources would actually be revision resources and things we can start creating into a library of ongoing curriculum resources, especially where they've been really well designed and they're really fit for purpose. So, yeah, there's an example of something that we've altered as we've gone. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Kate, do you have anything to add? Yeah, very similar, actually. One of the examples I was going to give was GCSE pod. We were setting some assignments, little things like a key question, which might be a multiple choice question, where, again, they've done so much thinking, you know, just to reiterate what Nick says, they've done a huge amount of planning and work behind the scenes. So they'll ask a question, which is on the face of it, a relatively simple multiple choice question where the right answer is obviously the right answer, but the wrong answers all pick up key misconceptions. They're not just randomly put in there. They're actually put in there to test if a misconception has occurred. You know, Nick was talking about assessment earlier and really good quality assessment has to be crafted and it takes time to do that. You can't write something very quickly and really make sure that it gets to the nub of of what you want to do. So that's why we've done an awful lot of sharing as well. So where people have put together questions, where they've put together lessons, where they've put together resources, where they've put together videos, they've shared, talked to the students. We've had staff sitting in with each other. When we started doing the the live lessons, the staff sat in with each other, partly for a bit of solidarity, but also partly to learn how to do things with each other. They were absolutely fantastic. And the same thing about the slides. And, and as I said in my presentation, the thought of having a very densely packed slide on a very small phone screen was just something that was that was a no-no. So you might have noticed my slides, you know, it's just a single big image where we'd already been doing quite a lot of work on dual coding and particularly for our students, Cognitive overload was a real, really big driver before lockdown. So when lockdown started, we were talking to staff about actually doing simpler screens and narrated PowerPoints and not having yourself appearing as a little person in the bottom of the screen because that that splits the attention of the students and becomes quite confusing. It's better to have a narrated PowerPoint with really simple points and leave pauses in there or even have a slide pause for 10 minutes and reflect on this you don't really wait for 10 minutes otherwise your video buffers but it's you know actually there were key points where we actually even had slides to tell children to stop and think and actually do some reflecting before they moved on to the next bit it's been a development of our teaching and learning it's not new but it's developed it very rapidly in a way that we were hoping to go it's just developed it in a uh, you know in a different time scale for us Both of you, thank you so much for adding um, a bit of extra insight with this discussion. And thank you very much. That's all for this week, everybody. I'm working on upcoming episodes on innovation with guests from Dubai, Brazil, Singapore and the UK, plus student experience and careers in higher education. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do drop us a rate or a view wherever you listen to your podcast. Take care. Bye-bye.